So uh, as we get into uh, Don Tucker's leadership in which you were the, the pro tem, talk to me about how you and Don became allies. Well, I first met Don in 1967 when I came to Tallahassee for that uh, special session and we all got thrown out of office because of the Supreme Court. Uh, I immediately liked him. He's a very personable fellow. And uh, I, I just, we just became friends. And so when Don decided that he wanted to run for speaker, uh, we were together one afternoon and he said, I'm going to run for speaker and I need your help. And I said, okay. I said, well, you know, I think I'm going to run for speaker pro tem and I could use your help. And he looked at me and I think it was a, a, an idea that came almost to both of us at the same time. Why don't we run together? Why don't we run as a tandem team? It had never been done before. Uh, have a governor, lieutenant governor. Why can't we have a speaker and a speaker pro tem on the same ticket? And he and I both liked that idea a lot. And so we declared our candidacy, that we were going to run as a team. And when you voted for one of us, you voted for both of us. And uh, it worked, and it worked really well. Uh, there were one or two instances which uh, when people might not particularly like me, but they like Don, but they had to vote for me too, and vice versa. They might like me, but not like Don. They had to vote for both of us, or they wouldn't vote for either one of us. Uh, but uh, we got elected, as you know, and then we stayed uh, two years, and we, we liked what we were doing, and I guess they liked what we were doing, so we decided we'd run for re-election. Which had never been done. Never been done before. We were, we were the first speaker and speaker pro tem that we declared, well, we, I guess we were a little brash. We said, we think we've done a good job, and you need us, so we're going to offer ourselves again. And we did, and uh, we were reelected. So that's how we got it. You, you announced that you would seek reelection uh, at the beginning of the 75 session, is that right? 76 session, so you would have, uh, you would have had uh, uh, all of the power of control of the session. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, a little bit, I guess. Uh, uh, it, 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 uh, that certainly didn't hurt us in our bid for re-election. Uh, and I don't know that, that Tucker or I used it to any great extent. Um, no more so than anyone else would have. But we did do a good job, and we accomplished a lot. And uh, so we were proud of what we had done, and we, we, we just wanted to continue to serve, and we did. Don and I were in office as Speaker, Speaker Pro Tem when the new legislative building was opened. And uh, we were sort of in charge of the furniture and the furnishings that went into the Capitol, and et cetera. And, uh, of course, Don later uh, received some criticism because of the amount of money that we had spent on his desk and his office, even though uh, President Brantley had spent exactly the same amount of money on his desk and his office. It seemed as though the House ended up being the, uh, uh, the recipient of most of that criticism, which later came back to haunt Tucker a lot, uh, which I thought was very unfair. But... Everything in life and in politics is certainly not fair, as we all know. So you have to live with it. How did John Riles and Don Tucker go about seeking the speakership? How long did it take? Uh, uh, how did you succeed? What, uh, what did you do? Oh, I think things that anyone would do in a normal uh campaign. I remember Don had a uh, kind of a vacation house or something up around Havana uh, and we decided to have a barbecue up there and we invited a lot of our friends up to Don's place there in Havana and we had already decided what we were going to do and uh, we were going to feed them some uh, good food and give them a few drinks and uh, then tell them that we were running as speaker, speaker pro tem. Uh, for the legislature, and that's exactly what we did. We probably had, we probably invited 40, 50 members of the House up there, guys that we felt like were our friends, that were going to support us once they knew what our intentions really were. Don had a lot of friends from North Florida, uh, and, and I had a lot of friends from Central and South Florida, 
And so we just invited them up to Tucker's place and uh, announced that we were going to run for speaker and speaker pro tem and we needed all their help. And it was pretty much a done deal at that time. And you didn't have any serious opposition? Not really. Yeah. And how, how, when did this take place in the scope of? Uh... A few months before, and Mike honestly can't remember. We were in session at the time. I guess it had to be one of those uh, special sessions that the governor had called. Uh, and I honestly can't remember what month it was. Uh, but uh, that's the way we did it. And uh, from then on, it was just kind of downhill after that. Let's, I, I probably got ahead of myself just a little bit. Let's go back a, a couple of years. Ruben Askey is elected governor. Mm -hmm. your, your surprises there when he was elected? And, uh. Not really. Uh, uh, governor Askey was a, uh, he was a good governor. He was one of the best governors I think the state of Florida's ever had. Uh, he did a couple of things that, that disappointed me. Uh, when he gave the, the pardon to Pitts and Lee, that... Uh, I did not think was justified, even though uh, there had been a book written about their innocence. Uh, he decided to give them a pardon, and he did. And uh, But by and large, I think Reuben Askew was a great governor of the state of Florida. It, did a, it helped education tremendously, moved the state forward in many, many ways. And uh, I like Reuben a lot. There was a, there was a uh, bill introduced by Pitts and Lee to... Uh, give them, it was a claims bill, to give them $100,000 each. Uh, since the governor had pardoned them for uh, the murder of the gas station attendants, and uh, they had served some time in prison, then they felt like that the state of Florida owed them some remuneration for, uh, I guess, what they considered a miscarriage of justice. And uh, Hyatt Brown was speaker. And Hyatt called me into his office one day and he said, I have a bill here that I'm going to have to create a select committee for. Now, I was chairman of the committee at this point on paramutuals, uh, regulated industries and licensing. I had my hands full. And Hyatt called me in and he said, I, uh, I have this bill and I had no idea what he was talking about. He said, I want to, I'm going to have to create a, a select committee on claims to hear this bill. And he said, I, uh, I want you to be chairman of the committee. I said, what is it? And he said, well, it's from uh, Pitts and Lee. He said they each want $100,000 uh, for their wrongful incarceration in the, state, in the penal system. And I said, well, I said, I've just got all I can handle. And I really don't particularly want to do this. I said, well, I just really don't know if anybody else I want to do it. And uh, he said, I, I'm not asking you to retry the case. What we need to know is, were they wrongfully incarcerated? I said, well, the governor obviously feels as though they were. He said, well, this is not the governor's office. This is the legislative office. And what we need to decide before we write a check for $200,000 is whether or not they had a fair trial and if there was any miscarriage of justice. I said, okay. I said, well, if you'll let me hire a legal counsel. He said, who do you want to hire? And I said, I want to hire Dexter Douglas. And I said, he's one of the best criminal attorneys I know of in the state of Florida. And I had gotten to know Dexter over a period of time. And I said, you got it. He said, what else you want? And I said, well, how many, how many people do you plan to have on the committee? And he said, well, he said, you'll be the chairman. He said, I want to keep this thing really fair. He said, let's put two Democrats and two Republicans on. And he said, and, and let's go at it. I said, okay. So that's what we did. And I created the committee, and he named me chairman. And, and we hired Dexter. And, uh, Mike, we, we probably looked at this situation close to a year. We spent quite a bit of money in legal fees, uh, research, uh, and our, our sole purpose was to find out whether or not the trial that was held was fair and impartial and that the decision had been reached in a 
legally just manner, regardless of what Reuben Askew had done. And so that was our charge, and that's what we did. And it was, it was a tough, tough meeting when I finally called the meeting to order to hear the bill. Uh, we had had many meetings prior to that final day, but I had announced that this would be the day when we would vote. And we had it in the Capitol, and uh, uh, Dexter gave his report to the committee and uh, felt that the trial that had been conducted had been a very fair and impartial trial. The witnesses had been heard, and the jury had made their decision and had found them guilty. Notwithstanding what the governor of the state of Florida later decided to do. And so the vote came down, and Mr. Pitts and Mr. Lee were there, along with their attorneys, and a whole crowd of people from the NAACP and the room was packed, and I called for the vote, and it was two for it and two against it, and I had to cast the deciding vote, and I voted no on awarding them the $200,000. Uh, it, was, it was probably the hardest vote that I've ever cast, but I honestly in my heart believed, and I still believe it to this day, that they did receive a fair and just trial, and that they were sentenced appropriately. And what Reuben Askew did later, only Reuben Askew, the governor of the state of Florida, knows why. But he honestly felt like I assumed that they were innocent, and that's why he gave them a pardon. Uh, I didn't happen to agree with that. I don't agree with that today. But that was probably the hardest vote that I have ever cast in my entire 14 years in Tallahassee. What made it such a hard vote? It was hard because... It's really hard to, to sit there, and we were not retrying the case, and, and perhaps we should have, but we didn't. We merely looked at the way the case was tried originally from a legal standpoint. But then for us to come in later and have a claims bill before us, and have to make a decision on whether or not these people were entitled to $100,000 each based on something that the state of Florida had done wrong. Your heart has got to say, well, maybe they were innocent. Maybe they really were innocent. And if they were, then $100,000 a piece is not enough. But we weren't there to do that. And that was a position and almost a predicament that we were put in by the legislation and the charge of Hyatt Brown, the speaker, was merely to look and see whether or not the trial had been conducted in a legal and lawful manner. And that, you know, and we found out that it was. And the people in that county uh, did a, and the judge and the attorneys and the prosecutor and everybody did a great job. And they were found guilty. But then when you look at it a few years later, especially with the governor having pardoned them because he believed they were innocent, and then it puts us in the position of, well, what do we do now? It was a tough, tough call. And uh, like I said, toughest one I've ever made. Jim Redman, uh, Barry Cooten opposed you and Don Tucker for to uh, retain the speakership. Pick it up there. I mean, what do you remember? Well, as I recall, uh, Don and I decided that we'd run for re-election since we thought we had done such a great job the first two years, you know. And uh, Don was, uh, so we announced that we'd run for re-election, and uh, Jimmy Redman uh, just didn't want any part of that. And so he decided he'd run, and then Barry Cooten got in and decided he'd run. And uh, I don't, I never took it personal, even though Don and I were running as a team, because Jim and I still remain close friends. We talked about it. Uh, Kooten and uh, Jimmy mounted a good campaign. And uh, in the final analysis, as I recall, Jimmy withdrew, and Kooten hung into the end and was defeated by me and Tucker. And the whole idea was uh, 
There were some that were calling for a secret vote because of the power you already wielded. Yeah, as I recall, that's, that's, that did take place. Uh, there were some motions uh, that, that the, vote, the vote be made secret. That, you know, we kind of put in a ballot box and have the names written and drop them in one at a time. And, of course, uh, Tucker didn't want any part of that. And uh, I didn't want any part of it either because, uh, I mean, if you're the speaker and the speaker pro tem and you have this power, why would you want to give it away? Uh, simply because there's an election to replace you. Um, and so we didn't. And uh, the motion uh, for uh, the secret ballot, ba ballot was defeated. <clears throat> it was an open vote, and uh, Tucker and I won re-election for another two years. And Barry Cootins immediately banished to the basement. Yeah, well, we lost Barry for a few weeks there. We put him so far in the basement we couldn't find him. Uh, but it, it, that was to be expected in those days. That wasn't harsh. That, that was just the way politics in Florida was done. Uh, and, and Barry knew the consequences, uh, just like anyone would know the consequences. So it wasn't all that bad. I think Barry, he, he, he really liked being in the basement. That way he could whine and moan and groan and get a lot of attention from the press. And, uh, and don't get me wrong, I love Barry Cooden. I think he's a great guy. And in fact, he was one of my biggest supporters when I decided to run for speaker. And, uh, but Barry knew, I mean, that was just... That's the way it was, and uh, uh, you, you're going to play the game, and you lose, you pay the price. Now, you ran. You thought Don was going to be leaving. <laughs> we all did. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Carter decided to run for president. And I was in my office in Brandon. And uh, my secretary buzzed me and she said, the speaker's on the phone. Okay. I picked up the phone. It was Don. He said, uh, I've got a fellow sitting here in my office. He said, and uh, he wants to talk to you. I said, who is it? He says, Governor Carter from Georgia. He said, you know he's running for uh, president. I said, yes. Uh huh. And Don says, I'm going to support him. He said, you haven't got yourself committed in this race yet, have you? I said, no, I haven't. And uh, Don says, well, here, let me put him on the phone. So Governor Carter gets on the phone. He said, you know, how are you, John? I said, I'm fine, Governor. He said, I understand from your good friend here in Tallahassee, Don Tucker, that uh, uh, I need to have you on my team in Hillsborough County on the west coast of Florida. I said, well, I appreciate that. I I said, uh, I'm going to support you. And I said, I think, you know, no doubt about it. Uh, I'll be on your team and I'll help you any way I can. He said, well, I really appreciate that. He said, uh, as a matter of fact, he said, uh, uh, Rosalind and I are going to be in Tampa uh, next week. We're going to fly in and uh, we, uh, we'd love to meet you. And maybe we could have dinner together at a restaurant there in Tampa and, uh, and get to know each other a little better. He said, Tucker tells me you're a real fine man. And he said, and I'd like to get, a, get acquainted with you. He said, I really don't have any kind of an organization in Hillsborough County. I really don't know anybody in Tampa. He said, there's a fellow there named Carter that's in the insurance business, but I'm not sure we're related. I said, well, I, I don't know either. I said, but I'm sorry, Governor. I said, but I'm not going to be here next week. I said, I've got to go to Tallahassee for committee meetings. He said, uh, well, okay. He said, well, we'll just uh, have to do the best we can then. I said, well, I'm sorry. I said, next time you're in town, give me a call. I got the phone. Well, Mike, I guess it was about a month later. Well, the next week, first of all, I came to Tallahassee. We had committee meetings. I went back to Brandon. About six weeks later, I guess it was, I'm sitting in my office. My secretary buzzed me. She said, uh, Governor Carter's on the line. I said, okay. So I picked up the phone. I said, Governor, how are you? He said, I'm fine. John, how are you? I said, I'm all right. He said, uh, listen. He said, uh, next week, he said, uh, gave me the date and the time. He said, Rosalind's going to fly into Tampa. And uh, she, uh, I just wondered if you could maybe go out to the airport and meet her and pick her up. They're, they're having a ladies' luncheon of some kind down there. And, he said, we really don't know much about it. 
He said, maybe you could find out something and take her to the lunch and drive her over there. I said, no, governor can't do that. I'm sorry. I said, uh, that's the same night. I'm having a big barbecue out here at my home in Brandon. And we've got a lot of people coming and it's kind of a block party. And I said, I'd be glad to come pick her up and bring her out here to the house. And Oh, no, she's got to go to this luncheon, you know. I said, well, I'm sorry. I just can't do it. He said, okay. Well, that was early in the campaign. Uh, a few years later, Tucker and I are called to the White House in Washington. Talk about the Panama Canal Treaty. Tucker has now been nominated by the president to the CAB, Civil Air Docs Board. And we go into this room, this conference room, and all the speakers from the southeastern United States were there. I was the only speaker pro tem, but Tucker had wanted me to come since I was going to replace him once he became, you know, a member of the CAB. The president walked in. And he looked around the room and he said, gentlemen, and uh, he talked to us and uh, told us why it was important that uh, we give, uh, we go along with this new treaty, uh, the Panama Canal. And he asked all the southeastern speakers for their support. I want you to go back to your, you know, your uh, states and uh, help me support this thing. And so we all agreed and thought it was a pretty good idea. And when the meeting was over, he looked at Tucker and uh, everybody kind of stood up and he looked at Don and he says, I want to see y'all in my office. Go on down there. So, Tucker, we start walking out the meeting and the president's still, I think we were in the Lincoln room, it was a big conference room. And so, he's, the president's walking around talking to all the other speakers. Tucker and I kind of ease on out because we know. So we get down to the Oval Office and I guess apparently the president had told them we were coming somehow. They let us in. We walk in the Oval Office. Now here, Don Tucker and John Riles by ourselves in the Oval Office. Tucker walks over and sits down behind the president's desk. I said, Tucker, get up from there. You can't be doing this. We didn't know that they had cameras in those days and there or what, you know. And Tucker said, ah, oh, it's okay, you know. So he's sitting there behind the president's desk. He didn't sit for just a minute. He got up and he came back around. Well, just in the nick of time, because the door opened, and then walks President Carter. He walks over and he said, Donald, how are you? Shakes his hand, gives him a big hug, and he, and he looks at me, and Tucker says, Mr. President, he said, this is John Riles. And the president looked at me and he said, uh, I hope you enjoyed your barbecue. I swear to God. I felt about that tall, you know. <laughs> he was really nice. I mean, you know, after that, he, the ice kind of broke. And I said, it was a good barbecue. You should have come, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But uh, I like Jimmy Carter a lot, and uh, but that's my that's a true Jimmy Carter story. He never forgot it. He's got a memory like a steel trap, and uh, so he 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 did a good job, I think, as president. And uh, but Tucker never got Tucker was nominated by him to the Civil Aeronautics Board. We thought Tucker was going to leave, and. Uh, so Alan Morris made the decision or the determination based on the rules of the House that there was really no proviso for me, the Speaker Pro Tem, to automatically succeed Tucker once he resigned and left, that we should have a new election. Well, after Alan gave me that determination of the rules, I went in and I sat down and I talked to Tucker and I said, we've got a problem. I said, you and I have run as a team. We have run in tandem for, for two elections. I said, but the thing we failed to look at, I'm really not going to become speaker without another election. Tucker said, well, I want you to be speaker. I said, well, I would like to be. I said, even though it may only be a year, at that point we thought that his nomination would go on through and he would have about a year left on his term as speaker. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to have an election in the House. I want to have this thing ironclad so that when you leave, uh, I will automatically become speaker. He said, all right, well, we just passed a new rule to that effect. And then we'll have an election. So we did. Uh, that upon the, uh, and I'm assume, I assume that rule is still in effect today. That uh, upon the, 
the termination or the demise or whatever of the present speaker, the speaker pro tem will automatically become the speaker, just like the lieutenant governor automatically becomes a governor. So we had an election, and uh, I was unanimously elected to succeed Tucker if and when he resigned to take the position of a, being a member of the CAB in Washington. Well, it was a great election. I mean, how many guys can say they've been elected as speaker uh, by 100% of the votes? Uh, Ed Blackburn, may God rest him in his soul in peace. I, I loved Ed Blackburn. Gave one of my main, he was my main, main nominating speeches. And Bill James, who was head of the Republican Party, gave my seconding nominating speech. So we had all the votes from the Democrats and the Republicans. And it was a great feeling uh, to know that your fellow members had that much confidence in you. The problem was that uh, Tucker's nomination ran into problems in Washington. Uh, a lot of hoopla over the desk that he had spent several thousand dollars for. Uh, same desk that Brantley had spent in the Senate. But the press uh, really kind of took it out on Tucker, and I thought unjustifiably so. Well, all of that reached Washington. The bad publicity, the bad press about the furnishings, the desk. And Don, to his credit, did not want to put the president through that. So when we were there, uh, Don and I sat down and we talked about it. And he said, I think I'm going to ask the president to withdraw my name. I said, well, there goes my speakership. And he said, well, I'm sorry. But he said, I just don't want to go through this. And I don't want the president to go through it. And I said, I agree. And so that's what he did. He asked President Carter to withdraw his name and nomination to the CAB. And so then Tucker, who had spent probably the last six months in Washington lobbying for that position, decided it was time to come back. And uh, he did. And uh, I had literally been running the house on a day-to-day -day basis for during that six-month period. And so we welcomed him back, and uh, we finished out our term with him as speaker and me as speaker pro tem. And so uh, I never officially became speaker, and Don never officially left. So that's the story of the speakership and President Jimmy Carter. Talk to me, uh, uh, Hyatt Brown, there was uh, a great deal of uh, uh, animosity still about your second term, it seemed, with some of those newer members, and uh, uh, they were casting themselves as the white hats and, and your administration as the black hats. Uh, yet you ended up, uh, uh, there were, there were, you ended up as a committee chairman under Hyatt Brown. Uh, talk to me, were you all surprised by the, uh, by the petition that the Brown forces had gathered, and were you part of that? I was surprised by it. Uh, I really was. Uh, I think Hot Brown uh, just did a masterful, uh, excellent job in his campaign for speaker. Uh, he pulled off, uh, it was just, it was unheard of. And the way he went about conducting his campaign and the way he won. Uh, and in the final analysis, uh, I was for Hyatt. Uh, Ed Fortune was his opponent. Ed was uh, a good guy from North Florida. I liked Ed a lot. Uh, but Hyatt was from, represented in my way of thinking, a more urban area, which was where I was from. Uh, I also liked Hyatt Brown a lot. And so I pledged to Hyatt, uh, not immediately. I was not in on the original uh, gang of five or whatever, however many there were. But uh, as the campaign started to unfold, it was a difficult decision for me because Ed Fortune had played such a, uh, a large role in our administration. And I say, our, my, Don Tucker and mine. And uh, it was very difficult for me to cast my vote with Hyatt against Ed. But in the final analysis, I really felt like that uh, it would be in the best interest of Florida. And in particular, the people that I represented from Hillsborough County to have a speaker not another speaker from North Florida, back to back, but 
they kind of rotated a little bit. Even though Daytona, some people might say, is in North Florida, I consider it more of an urban area than we, when you compare it to the Florida pork chop days. And even though Tucker was not a pork chopper either, uh, Tucker was, he was very fair in, in the distribution of monies and funds, even though he certainly looked out for North Florida and Leon County in particular, which is what he's supposed to do. That's where he was from. But I went with Hyatt Brown over Ed Fortune in that campaign, and uh, I've always been glad that I did. Uh, Hyatt, I think, made one of the great speakers that the Florida House has ever had. That uh, Politically, did that cause difficulty with you with the speaker, uh, Tucker, and uh, with Ed? Uh, not really. Not really. Uh, there really wasn't a, a lot of difficulty there because Tucker tried to stay impartial as well. Now, a lot of people thought he was really for Ed, and I'm sure that he was, but 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 Don Don tried to really be fair-minded about it and, and not, you know, try to be, exert his influence in it to any great extent. So, and Ed Fortune being the gentleman that he is, uh, there was never any hard feelings between me and Ed Fortune over that, not at all, or anything else that I recall. Now, Don Tucker was, and, and was speaker and you were pro tem, when Dempsey Barron was president of the Senate, and to many of us watching, it appeared there was uh, a, a game, uh, some gamemanship uh, and one-upmanship going on between the speaker and the president. What can you tell me about that? Um, I guess there was to a certain extent. Uh, both men, to their credit, had extremely large egos, uh, almost out of proportion in certain areas. Uh, well, what are you going to do? And when you've got two people that are that powerful, that when the president of the Florida Senate and the speaker of the Florida House, I mean, that power is just awesome. Give me a, a, a sense. How does John Riles and his public service, how would he be best remembered? How would you like to be remembered? Oh, as a guy that uh, tried to do what he thought was right, approached it with, I think, a lot of integrity. Uh, we did a lot of wonderful things for Hillsborough County in particular. When you look at the authorities that we created or helped to create, and I don't take credit for them, I was just one of nine guys, the Hillsborough County Legislative Delegation in those days had a tremendous amount of respect from <clears throat> everyone, both local and statewide. Terrell Sessoms was speaker. Uh, we did a lot of good things. We helped to move forward the University of South Florida. Uh, we helped create the medical school, USF. We created the uh, Aviation Authority, which ended up building what we consider to be the world's greatest airport. We created the Sports Authority the new Raymond James Stadium. We created the Expressway Authority, the Crosstown Expressway. Uh, in fact, I can remember so well when the Expressway was first built and it was authorized by the Board of County Commissioners. It was built from downtown Tampa to the Interbay. I can remember walking in the right-of-way when it was under construction and it was running right parallel to the railroad tracks. And I remember telling them, I said, you're going to have a problem with the, the railroad because of the headlights oscillating on the diesel locomotives. It's going to be shining right down this, right down this highway. And uh, they corrected that problem. They got with the railroad and they worked it out. But that expressway was originally built from downtown Tampa to Dale Mabry, Interbay. It was a financial disaster. Everyone knew it was going to be a financial disaster, but the board county commissioners were just hell-bent for leather. That's where they were going to put it, and they did. And then they came to Tallahassee, and they wanted relief. They wanted us to create an a, uh, expressway authority that could build it from where it started in downtown Tampa toward Brandon. And I, as a resident of Brandon, was really irritated and perturbed because they had built the wrong leg first from downtown to Interbay. And I remember Ellsworth Simmons, who was chair of the Board of County Commissioners, 
Dick Greco, who was mayor, first time he was mayor, they came to Tallahassee and they had this bill. And I was being quite hard hit. Uh, I was going to hold out. And in those days, we sort of had an unwritten rule in the delegation that if any one member of the nine members didn't really want it, it wasn't going anywhere. It had to be almost unanimous. And in particular, whose area it was going to directly affect, like my area in Brandon, where I lived. And I was really upset because they had built it in the wrong place in the first time. And so I remember Ellsworth and Dickey and some other members of the county commission coming to Tallahassee and really lobbying us hard for that expressway authority and get to give them the authority to build that section from Tampa to Brandon so they could bail out the first section that they had built. It should have never been built first. It should have been built second. They just completely reversed the deal. And I was the last guy, and I played, I played some real hard politics with them for about three days up here. I refused to do it, and I told them I was going to veto it on the House floor. And uh, so finally, uh, through the persuasion of Dick Greco and Ellsworth Simmons, I decided that I would sign off on it, and I did. Went ahead and they created it, they built it. It's been a great financial success ever since. But even more importantly, it has really served the people of Brandon well. Uh, they're now, as you well know, adding an upper deck to the expressway. Uh, so they're going to have three lanes up there where they can reverse them in and out in the mornings. And it's going to really be of great benefit. So I'm real proud of the role that I helped to play many, many years ago in the financing and in the building of that expressway authority, along with, like I said, uh, University of South Florida School of Medicine, Aviation Authority, uh, Expressway Authority, all of those. We did a lot of good things during those 14 years, I think. When someone comes to you and says, Mr. Roth, I want to run for the legislature, or I've just been elected to the legislature. How do I be a good, good member? What do you tell them? Well, I, I, uh, when, when I decided in 1980 that I would not run for re-election, I guess I caught, a, I, I, I caught a lot of people by surprise because I had not had an opponent in all oh, the last two or three elections prior to that. But I had gone through some personal uh, uh, tragedies in 79 and in 80. And it just seemed to me as though it was time to uh, hang it up and go back home. So Spud Clements, who was the head of the Florida Highway Patrol in the west coast of Florida, had been a dear friend, a friend of mine for years. And Spud came to me about two years before I made this decision. And he said, if you ever decide that you're not going to run for re-election, he said, I'd like to run. I said, well, how are you going to do that? He said, well, I'll go ahead and retire from the Florida Highway Patrol. I've got enough time in. I'd like to run. I said, okay. So when I made my decision, before I publicly announced it, I called Spud. And I told him, I said, Spud, next week I'm going to announce that I'm not going to run for re-election. So if you want to have at it, better start gearing up. And uh, he said, all right. He said, well, will you publicly endorse me? I said, no. I, I don't think it's my position to publicly endorse my successor. I just don't think that's right. I said, I'm giving you a heads up on it. And that's all I'm going to do. And I said, you know, I'm not going to endorse you. And I'm not going to speak for you. But I'm sure as heck not going to speak against you either. Because he was a friend. And so that's what I did, and uh, uh, Spud won, he took my place. What really surprised me was the day I announced, within two days we had like 10 people trying to run for my seat. I didn't know there was that many people out there wanting my job, and uh, that kind of shocked me. But Spud, uh, being the best known, uh, he ran a good campaign, he won, he was elected and he served and did a good job. As a matter of fact, became chairman of the... Uh, Committee on House Administration, which I was chairman of for six years. And uh, so, but I just, I, I really don't get involved in it that much anymore, Mike. Um, 
I think the only advice I could give anybody is to just listen to the people and try to do what you think is in their best interest. Now, they may not always think that what you are doing is in their best interest. And that's where you have to really exercise your willpower. And you've got to exercise some intestinal fortitude to look at people and say, you're wrong. And I'm here to represent you. And I know that what I'm telling you is the right thing to do. And you don't believe that, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then you go do it. You vote and you do what you think is right. And 99% of the time, if, you're, if you've got any common sense at all, and a lot of integrity, it'll turn out right. I always try to tell the truth. Uh, and why, and give a, a logical explanation as to why we did something. And I, I found over my 14 years, the public's pretty intelligent. And if you can just communicate with them and let them know what's going on and why you're voting the way you vote on something, yeah, you're never going to get 100% of them, but you can change a lot of votes. And uh, I think just tell the truth and be honest with the public. Well, I am out of questions, sir. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about? There any good stories that we haven't asked you about? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I really enjoyed it. It's been a great pleasure to be here with you in Tallahassee this morning. I came up, uh, well, about a month ago. They had uh, Hyatt Brown's 25th anniversary reunion celebrating his 25th year as speaker. And frankly, that was the first time I'd been back in Tallahassee in almost 25 years. And I just thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, when I received your call, uh, it was my pleasure to come back up here and sit down with you again today. And uh, I thank you for allowing me to be here with you. It's always been a pleasure. Mike Vassalinda, you, uh, you've always been a good reporter, and I always, I've always enjoyed watching you. Still watch you on Channel 8 in Tampa, and uh, one of my favorite TV stations. So uh, I just thank you for letting me be here with you this morning and being a part of this. Well, thank you, Mr. Ralph. I appreciate you being here as well.